Okay. Great. So today we're very, very glad to have everyone here with us on this topic. Good day, everyone. Thank you for joining today's meeting with the topic on social entrepreneurship, the paradigm for a better tomorrow. I'm Bonnie, who is the moderator of today's meeting, and let me briefly introduce myself. I'm currently the executive director of Social Enterprise Research Academy, which is founded in 2014, with a mission of harness the markets to bring social caring. And based in Hong Kong, our academy aims to create a cross-sectoral platform to foster communications and to global and to gather global elites from various industries into one unparalleled platform that fosters sustainable developments in Asian communities. Hopefully today through our discussion, together we could reimagine a paradigm that can achieve a prosperous and sustainable world for all. In view of the COVID-19 pandemic, which has been an unparalleled crisis, social entrepreneurs across the globe have been providing support to the marginalized communities that are hit hardest by the health and economic impacts from the pandemic such as bringing affordable health care to those in need, protecting livelihoods, and providing emergency relief swiftly. Looking ahead, the question would be how social entrepreneurs as a sector can be much more agile, adapt and expand our influence, and to move forward faster during this defining time. As showing the World Bank's projected poverty impacts, an additional 100 million people could slip into extremely poverty in the coming time, which is a number that could easily climb higher. So today, a few entrepreneurs from different parts of the world all came to one table through this international platform, Horasis, in hope that by sharing the lessons we have learned in the pandemic and how we could have avoid common pitfalls that could slow down our response to support social entrepreneurs during this crisis, and hopefully, we all were able to adapt more quickly. So today we have five excellent speakers and let me introduce them one by one. First is Mr. Morris Haley, Chief Executive Officer from the Haley Group from Ireland. And the second is Mr. Alan Lau, President of Anglo Euro Energy from Indonesia. And Mr. Michele Bonanno, Founder of Imparka from the United Kingdom. And Ms. Robin Van. Dallin, CEO of Inuka Coaching from the Netherlands. And last would be Mr. Jeremy Yuan Fong, the co-founder of Udentity in China. And in the coming time, I would be introducing each speaker with a key question that enable them to share accordingly. So Mr. Morris Haley, uh, who is the first speaker of today, let me briefly introduce Mr. Morris Haley who is a well-known businessman and philanthropist. He is the CEO of the Haley Group, which is a distributor for manufacturers of food ingredients and chemicals with bases in Dublin, China, and UK. Mr. Morris strongly believes that corporate sector would support, should support communities and social enterprise. So over the last 25 years, has been engaging in many organizations associated with social, entrepreneur, social entrepreneurs and enterprises, such as chairing the Social Enterprise Task Force for five years and also being on the board of Social Entrepreneurs Ireland for a decade. He does not only focus on supporting domestic social enterprises in Ireland to have government policy commitments on public procurement, which creates significant local employment opportunities. He has also extended his influence on East Africa through knowledge transfer and skill development to empower the developing world. So as a result of his works in Uganda, his social enterprise on growing char seeds is now supporting over 10,000 farmers, creating new employment and bringing in income earning opportunities to the developing world. He's currently the chairman of NGO Tridlings, which is an Irish government initiative to develop business opportunities in the East Africa and is known as Self Help Africa that is dedicated to ending hunger and poverty in the rural Africa. So my question for Mr. Morris, would, would, would you please share, based on your global experience with social enterprises, can you share with us on what parts could social entrepreneurship play in order to keep bringing on social and economic value to support its communities and also enable a sustainable recovery in this pandemic? Thank you, Mr. Morris. 
Good morning, everybody. Um, I presume I will start by the, I presume the heading, which is the paradigm for a better world. The difficulty here is that, in fact, is that have we learned anything from the COVID problem of the last 18 months to two years? And sometimes, as I see the unfolding changes because of the vaccination program, I'm not certain we have. The first thing has to be the common purpose, the common purpose of every single person in the world to address the people who are less fortunate than ourselves. And there has never been a, a need for governments in total around the world to look to the vaccination program to first and foremost solve the existings of the existing pandemic. Now, let's look at the models in so far as you can change anything. First, it requires people. And people must be the center of the place you want to deal with this problem. It is not about policy. You must look at the people first. Unfortunately, governments have a tendency to create policy without purpose. And what we need to now and address as a community of business people is that we must deliver the issue of direct intervention. And I think every business person in the world has that opportunity. It doesn't really matter where your location is. I'll take the example of the position that was taken by Irish business people immediately after the earthquake in, in Haiti in 2010. Led by a gentleman called Leslie Buckley, immediately the reaction was to go on the ground and deal with the problem. It wasn't about money. It was about physicality. It was about presence. And it was also about support. That program, first and foremost, dealt with the fundamentals of the immediate aftermath of the earthquake, which was to do with of the food, hygiene, sanitation. But the fundamental of that particular program was to do with social enterprise and bringing models of business to communities where they could help each other and help themselves. And this is where business comes with the idea, the support, and they can also bring with them the people. So I would be asking the people around the world who are involved in uh, businesses that have opportunities to transfer, to go to locations where the need is most wanted, and to collectively form a group that can actually help those who need it most, particularly because of the problems of COVID. Thank you. Bonnie, your mic. So thank you very much, Mr. Morris, for sharing. Yes. So we're we're very glad to understand more about like common purpose, and to maybe we would have Mr. Alan Lau to share as the next speaker. Mr. Alan Goji Yoji Lau is the founder and CEO of Anglo Euro Developers Singapore, and president director of its subsidiary PT Anglo Euro Energy Indonesia. AEEI. Alan is an oil and gas entrepreneur with over 35 years in energy and power generation experience in Southeast Asia. He is also an active member in the United Nations Economic Commission for Europe, Energy Sustainable Energy Division, and in team of specialized on public-private partnerships. Alan, can a new paradigm for social entrepreneurship be implemented? in this time of present pandemic where budgets are actually seriously strained in in this you know in governments and private sectors so where are the structural changes needed under this pandemic shift could you share more with us please yes i guess the present you know situation is that there are new variants new mutated variants that are more spreadable and the virulent that has led to further lockdowns this has impacted on the economies of most countries in the world and has led also accompanied by rising un unemployment. So this leads to the question, two fundamental questions, can social entrepreneurship be promoted sustainably and can a new paradigm be implemented under such challenging times? The answer is yes, but five features needs to be present. One, the government support is needed. The private sector cannot do this alone. And 
social and community program must be focused on the performance-based, results-oriented, sustainable program. Number two, they are the core values, value for people and value for community. These must take precedent over the value for money, which is you know, the present practice. So direct benefits must go to the communities. Third is innovative financial solutions. In such times of strained budgets, decreasing budgets can be enhanced through blended finance, whereby the private investors can come in and finance social programs. And in addition, the revenue stream of social infrastructure projects can be monetized to fund the subsequent rounds of project development. Now, fourth is an efficient and effective distribution system from the federal government right down to the communities that are affected, to the areas and communities, including households. So there must be a prompt relief, aid, and services responsive from the federal government to the most affected areas and households. This can be accompanied by the digital tech, that the technology, such as in the mobile app-based applications, whereby the community and people are in the front line. And lastly, the new paradigm must include the 17 sustainable development goals, along with the Paris Agreement, the latest revision, and the National Net Zero Emission Program. These are these factors are interactive. It's just not independent just by itself. Thank you. Thank you very much for sharing, Mr. Allen. Yes, I agree that um, we have to include the SDGs into the goals as well. So, um, and we will have Mr. McCallie Benano, who is the founder of Imparka from UK to share with us. Mr. McCallie, you're we understand that you are an italian belgian social entrepreneur and you found uh, in Parca since 2014. So you are now the founder and CEO of Imparca, which is a London and Rome-based startup dedicated to empowering a sustainable lifestyle. We know that Imparca has grown from an online magazine since 2014 to become today's online platform with four core activities. So first is the Imparca News, which is a news and opinion outlet, reaching over 600 global organizations already. And the second, it is in Parker Up, and a startup hub that started in 2018 to match social good entrepreneurs with key stakeholders and to engage with impact investors. And the third is in Parker Index, a sustainability index that you started in 2020, assessing SDGs compliance of business and you further on creating in Parker Echo, a marketplace for sustainable and verified consumer goods, where the public at large will be able to buy verified Echo products covering all aspects of their life. So you know, it's very all-rounded, you know, your business model. So I'm really amazed. So can you share with us, hit hard by COVID and transformations have occurred as a result of triple shock of public health emergency, economic shutdowns, and social isolation. Have you actually examined which of these behavioral changes are likely to become permanent and consider whether this may ultimately promote or restrain sustainable lifestyle choices? How could company evolve and manage its global distributed workforce as well as achieving a positive impact environmentally and socially? Mr. McKelly, please kindly share. Thank you. Sure, sure. Thank you, Bonnie. So, <clears throat> as, as a startup, uh, we definitely covered the, the fourth point of Alan. So, uh, the digital transformation of social good entrepreneurs and how we effectively bridge uh, between third world countries and people in need and uh, people that have the ability to fix problems. So, Impact in itself is, you know, is a platform that is. At this point, fully distributed. Our workforce, we're only 10 in Rome, but we're 70 across the world. Uh, 
what we what I've experienced in the last year and a half is a change of the workforce in my team. Uh, I, I won't lie that quite a few people uh, suffered uh, from a mental point of view uh, COVID, and so I lost a few individual in that sense. But I also saw a, a, a change in how professionals around the age of 30 view their career. And I think COVID brought like an awareness, and I hope it will continue to do so, of the real need that our world has effectively, not just serving the big four consultancy firms or the banks, but actually looking at social good entrepreneurs and social good startups and approaching them. So effectively, this has allowed me to uh, onboard much stronger candidates for the role uh, with a lot more experience behind them. So this this has been very interesting. Uh, and so that has to be the first behavior changes in my, say, uh, uh, um, generation. So in the millennials, things have changed. It's not just I I am for the environment, I care about it, I might even strike with Greta Thunberg, but actually now I'm going to take a job that is meaningful to me. Uh, so that's the first thing I have come to, to see. Um, for the rest, big corporation, as we have an index for sustainability, so effectively we, we have this AI tool and also we have a, a team of analysts that runs through how any corporation actually at this point that we partner up now with the UN on this tool to look at how compliant they are with the SDGs. We've seen a real change on how corporations are behaving. Uh, not yet as we hope, but there is a, a real change. I mean, just recently Shell uh, got, uh, yes, exactly, Robin, Shell got uh, a really good news on from my point of view. Um, and I hope this trend will also continue from the government side. So it's not just corporations that are trying to change, but the government are trying to implement uh, um, policies and changes in those that badly behave. Um, <clears throat> now, but that doesn't mean that I, I, uh, I have great hope. Uh, the financial industry also has to change. You we have ESG funds with over $45 trillion on the management. Um, $45 trillion is a hefty sum of money to have an impact. Uh, but we yet to see a transfer from just renewable energy investments, which are very kosher, very vanilla flavor investments, but one that does it looks very good when they do it, to more uh, widespread investment across multiple industries and verticals, essentially, to generate impacts. So, um, yeah, ESG cannot be just a few multinational or just renewable energy. So I hope with millennials coming in, new wealth transfer, uh, passing from the current wealthy uh, individual to, you know, the, those that are 40, 50, and 60s, hopefully this will change how social impact will be done and effectively brings uh, a sustainable lifestyle uh, to the forefront. We'll see. I'm hopeful. Thank you very much for sharing, Mr. McCallie. So, and we will have our speakers, and Mr. Jeremy Yunfeng, who is actually the co-founder of Udentity in China. So, Jeremy Yunfeng, you are an entrepreneur and co-founder of Udentity. I can hear some sound. Sorry, can you? Yes, thank you. So, Jeremy Yunfeng, you are an entrepreneur and co-founder of Udentity an education platform providing digital solutions for universities to connect with students, parents and high school across Asia. So founded in 2018, Udentity has over 600, 400 universities, has reached over 400 universities, active users of 35 countries, participating in virtual fairs and online events. We have also co-founded the Change Leader Academy, running programs for high school students in Shanghai, to kickstart their social entrepreneurship journey. So prior to this, Jeremy spent five years at Ashoka, a largest network of leading social entrepreneurs where he launched the Singapore and Malaysia market office. 
Jeremy is also active in social good initiatives where support his family on several philanthropic ventures with a focus on supporting change makers and education across Southeast Asia. So Jeremy, could you share with us about your views on what essences are required in today's education and for future generation to nurture the wanted social entrepreneurs we wanted for our future? Thank you, Jeremy. Thank you, Bonnie, uh, and thank you to all the previous speakers as well. So I think one thing that I've uh, experienced through the time that I had at Ashoka was uh, the fortune of being able to connect with a lot of social entrepreneurs around the world who do amazing and fascinating work. But I think oftentimes it was seemed to put a lot of these individuals on kind of this high bar pedestal where uh, folks uh, who may not completely resonate with you know, the, the vision and mission of some of these individuals just wanted to see how they can utilize their day-to-day -day, uh, skills or what they do to be a positive contributor to the world. And I think one thing we realized was along the way that the education system that we currently have today, as uh, the late Sir Ken Robinson mentioned, is it was conceived during the Industrial Revolution. A lot of these models and ideas have not changed since then, which forces things like creativity, collaboration to be uh, kind of subdued and squelched, right? Which forces a lot of uh, the future generations of youth to be more conforming to things and not seeing the problems that are in our society. So the challenge with this education system is that lack of autonomy, inauthentic learning, building competition and more memorization and not built on passion or what's going on in the world so that once they do, say, graduate from university or they uh, or start uh, getting involved in the workforce, they don't actually resonate the things that they've learned in how they can be a, a contributor to society. So the belief that others in this space, including myself, is that there needs to be a rethink of how we look at social entrepreneurship and change makers to look at skill sets in education, where building different uh, practices, ideas, or sharing how, say, science relates to problems um, in climate change for the today's youth and future to look at how to build more problem-solving skills, empathy, creativity, critical thinking, communication, and collaboration. Because as a change maker, we can all contribute to society in one form or another because we have different skill sets and we have different resources available to us to be part of kind of uh, the development as a whole. While I am not always optimistic of uh, education systems not changing around the world, especially uh, being in China at the moment where there's this Gaokao exam uh, where every student has to kind of memorize a set of uh, answers, I do have faith that there are individuals such, such as the ones on this panel or others around the world that really do stand by raising either their children or uh, helping to support those uh, social entrepreneurs to reshape education. That's all great. Thank you. Thank you, Jeremy, for sharing. Especially maybe later on, you can share with us more on what's the situation now in China, like uh, during the q and section. So, Robin, thank you very much for joining us. And Robin Van Dalen is a social entrepreneur, graduated from the University of Cambridge with a passion for mental health and changing the capitalist system from inside out. She is the chief executive officer and also the co-founder of Inuka Coaching, which focuses on making effective mental health support accessible for everyone and helping companies to offer a cost-effective digital mental health support to keep their employees resilient. Inuka's mission is to make well-being accessible for everyone with their evidence-based coaching platform. Inuka offers a well-being tracker to enroll companies' employees with access to their coaches as well. So my question would be for in the pandemic, in the post-pandemic era, there's an urgent need to reorganize existing mental health services to address the current and needs for mental health and co-prepare for future challenges in terms of prevention and management. And from a humanitarian point of view, 
could you tell us more about how companies could induce social entrepreneurship to meet the burden of mental health issues in the post COVID nineteen era and to extend its power for sustainable recovery in the interest of a shared humanity? Please share. Thank you, Robin. Yeah, thank you very much for a great introduction, <laughs> Bunny. Um, yeah, so I think there's three main things why right? uh, how mental health really can help companies to be more social and also be more thriving. Um, and I think the first one is really that uh, I think it's also something um, that Mr. Michele uh, shared before, um, that it's just essential, right? We see now that workers are overwhelmed. It's so It's been a really tough time and now we're slowly getting out. Some people are falling over before we make the end line. Um, so I think it's very to keep your company sustainable, to keep your company flourishing, to make sure you're, you can deal with all the change that's coming up. Now the economies are opening again. I think it's just essential to support your workers in that. Um, and that's not just a social thing. It's also just a, a business thing. And that leads me also to the, to the second point. I think already before COVID, one in four workers were uh, struggling. Like they were not in the optimum format. They, were uh, not feeling very well, they were less productive, more negative, um, because it's just not an ideal like system that we've built. I think it also comes already back to the foundations that we heard before from Jeremy, um, uh, where the foundations of how we sort of build businesses and build society and build education is just not healthy for people in general. And that's, yeah, if we sort of make more space for people to connect with themselves uh, and to take care of their mental health, you also just build a better business and people get more productive. They see more opportunities, they're more creative. Uh, so I think that's also just very important. I think the last point I want to make is that, the, um, uh, and this is maybe a little bit more philosophical, but I think we're in a kind of nice group where this, these kind of points can be made. Uh, I think if all of us would just take more of the time to reflect, to get out of the dread race, and if employers would give the employees time to reflect, and get out of the, the constant survival mode will you, or constant more, more, more kind of mode that we've created with this capitalistic system. I think all of us would also uh, reconnect more with what's really needed in society. What are the real needs that we're trying to serve as companies and as people? And also um, how not to destroy a planet that sort of is our home. Because uh, I, I really feel that everyone I, I know that sort of took the step back and took this time to take care of themselves also sort of recognized, hey, I don't want to live this unsustainable life anymore for the planet. You know, I want to take care of the of, of this this home that we all have. I want to take care of nature. Um, and I want to take care of, of people around us, uh, around me. So I think that's also something that if you create a space, um, this is something that uh, yeah, I think would be better for everyone uh, if we if we create more space like that. So that's all my thoughts. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you very much for sharing this, Robin. And so Let's see if we can have a time for a follow-up question. Um, so any, are there any questions from the board? Like, please feel free to share. I can see Mr. Arun and Mr. Michello, you're in the room. So thank you for joining us and see if you could actually share with us about your question. You can type it on the, on the chat box and I can actually raise out to the floor and ask questions or actually among our speakers, because we have uh, very interesting profiles among us. So you can also feel free to ask each other questions to follow up on certain kind of points and see if we could um, discuss more and get more in depth into the topic. Yeah, Jeremy, I'm really curious how, um, uh, because I mean, especially in China, how you can help transform the education system, because if I understand it correctly, it's very centrally organized. Um, and I think this kind of thinking that you sort of advocate, it's crucial for entrepreneurship in general, right? And, and especially social entrepreneurship. So how do you, uh, get, how can you contribute to that in practice? Uh, yeah, thank you, Robin. That's a very tricky question that uh, I am still far too... Uh early on to be able to answer properly. But I think uh, one thing that we've tried to do at least is uh, that the, the way the education system does work over here is it's very much uh, merit-based. That kind of similar to what we see in uh, 
the East Asian countries and even in Singapore, for instance, right? It's, it's very much uh, grades oriented. But say today there's about 10.8 million students taking this Gaokao exam, but there is a majority of those students that don't make it into what's classified as like the high scoring uh, students that will struggle to find a university. So it's up to us to either connect them to alternatives or programs that might suit their learning styles and behavior to help expose a lot of these uh, new education programs for parents. So like one of our friends runs a, um, it's like a design school for those that don't perform well in the Gaokao exam. And then at the beginning, it's very hard for them to be able to convince parents and look at alternative education. But slowly, the more they get exposed to this, the more they can prepare for uh, a different pathway where it's looking at, uh, you know, say, design skills or uh, public speaking skills instead of just performing high scores. I think I don't foresee China ever chaining that idea of, you know, higher high performing grades and tests, but hope to kind of move some traffic towards the other side in the future. Great. So in the room, we can thank you, Mr. Arun and Mr. Michello for your question. And also very thank you very much, Robin, for your question as well. So as we can see that there are two questions from the floor. So see if any of the speakers can help to answer accordingly. First, the question is Ms. from Mr. Aaron. There's a lot of focus on physical and digital infrastructure. So how does one strengthen social infrastructure? Hmm. See if any one of you would like to answer this question, please. Yeah, I think I can give a practical example that has been applied. And this is actually invented in Indonesia. It won the UN Public Service Award in 2019. It is called Peta ben, the Benchana, which means disaster mapping. It is done by a, a group of young people uh, whereby they put people as sensors. So it is a mobile web base where there is a reporting at the ground level, at grassroots level, and it goes the, from the data collection to emergency response. As you know, Indonesia is prone to flood, earthquakes, etc. So all these natural de that disaster so there is an app application that is being designed, and then this is reported to the central command centers. And from there, they can make into a visual map. So it's an open source software uh, where they work on the, on the principle that, pe that people are sensors. So this has worked very well. I'm just giving how technology can be applied, all right, in terms of, uh, in terms of crisis. Very good, very good. And another question is from Mr. Mach uh, he's asking, what are your thoughts on starting purpose-driven NGOs as a path towards becoming an entre social entrepreneur in those segments? What are your thoughts um, on something purpose-driven? So, Robin, yeah, please feel free. Uh, just a very quick thought, and then anyone else can add to that. Uh, but I think uh, we should be much more agnostic about how we make purpose how we drive impact. So whether so some areas, I think an NGO is a better vehicle. In some areas, it's like a business or a social enterprise, it's a better vehicle. For example, we chose a hybrid end, so where we have an enterprise where we sort of charge the people that can pay lots of amounts and the people that cannot pay, we make it available for free via our NGO. Um, and I think in, typically I would use NGOs for any kind of population where our business model doesn't work. Um, so that's sort of my differentiation, but I would love to hear how the others look at this. Yes. Yeah, I would I would agree with that. I mean, it, it is terribly important that NGOs have a, a presence, particularly in the developing world. But at the same time, they do need the business community to be there and to follow their journey. As I said, I started uh, um, in, in Uganda with the chia seed production. Sadly, again, and I say sadly in the context of the, the discussion we have today, the COVID has had a massive effect on the chia program in Uganda to the extent in actual fact that most farmers are not producing chia currently. And so we have to ha start a reseed program, which again requires intervention and also the business community. So yes, you do need NGOs and yes, NGOs do need business acumen and business uh, ideas, which actually leads on to the whole idea of social enterprises within NGOs. True. Would you like to share Mr. McKelly? 
Yeah, yes, absolutely. So <clears throat> Impactor uh, is part of UN Women. Um, and so some of the activities that we do is we look after startups in the, the our focus on you on women and issues uh, around their lives one of them uh, that I follow myself and I've been involved in the past three months is a startup well it started as a as a movement uh, in my country and uh, and uh, was about um, bringing awareness regarding violence against women especially in the streets when going coming back home um, and this started uh, realistically at the beginning of March um, so the way I structure them is I set up an association so an NGO uh, which is focused on uh, education and uh, and we will be having a, a, a space for them here uh, as well and hopefully this will be various chapters are around Italy and then what's called pink space which is bars and restaurants that are harbor for women if they feel unsafe to uh, to be protected if they are uh, attacked or they feel that they, they will be attacked in the streets furthermore they are there is the service of going live so imagine you're walking back to your car to your house and you're not feeling uh, very secure you go on a live video call members of the this association and in fact you are recorded until you get back home safely now this has worked really well so this uh, organization has grown from zero followers to a hundred thousand and being present on every media outlets that uh, possibly can in in italy and also from vogue to uh, uh you name it even vice obviously vice magazine actually um but what we're doing now is we're also uh, creating a business model and a, a effectively turning into a startup uh with a premium model which i think it's not far from what robin uh, uh does so a, a, a service that is uh for payment for those that can effectively and for those that cannot do it uh it's free and so this this is how I structured. So yes, started with an NGO, focus on education and, and so on, and now transforming into also a, a, a side entity, uh, which is purely for business, for social good entrepreneurs. So there is a sustainable business model there, uh, but there's also uh, some free services. So it can be done. It's tricky to tell you, Marcello, it's tricky to do it well, uh, because you will be attacked somebody will say, oh, you uh, you should have thought about the others and should have not thought about making money. But the reality is this, this kind of attitude has to stop. Uh, otherwise, you're not going to eat at the end of the day. So the founders, the people that give 100 hours a week would not have food on the table. So I think it's important to have the two sides of it for the 4.0 industries, if you like. So that's my take on it. Very well said. Thank you, Mr. McCallie. And see if there are any other questions in the table. And anyone of you would like to respond to the question. If not, I would like to follow up one of the questions that I would like to ask Mr. Allen. So, because I know that you have been um, very into sustainable recovery program. Can you tell us more about what financial innovation you think is needed for a sustainable recovery program? Yes, I think the financial innovation is very important because this is the key to actually finance much needed social program. The gap has got wider right now. There's more the gap between you know the have and the have nots and the and caused by the rising un, the unemployment. So what is needed is actually for government to be involved. Government must give the incentive. It will go a long way if government give a guarantee. Now, let me give a practical example. There are so many infrastructure projects, trillions of dollars, in economic infrastructure, social infrastructure projects across the globe. But yet, the question is, has it benefited the community? I see very little. The flow of all these projects does not flow down to the actual... Because everybody is putting emphasis on value for money, the investors, etc. So how are you going to have a sustainable people-oriented, community-oriented system. I think that is a very important focus that needs 
you know, to be done. So if the government, a, a practical solution, if the government were to set up a fund or a national trust whereby infrastructure projects, the future revenue stream, even a small percentage, can go into this fund and it, it goes direct to the communities. This has been applied in uh, Canada, so it has worked well for their own business activities where the government allocated certain funds to their just indigenous people called the First Nations. So within two years, they have seen the results. It means initiated by the government is able to fund all the, sub, the, sub, the subsequent social programs for the this indigenous tribes. So it has been applied. It has been proven. I just hope that this can be applied. Let me just lastly say that this is not only ESG. I mean, there's no, like, for example, low carbon projects where there are lots of greenwashing, right? I mean, these are actual help and that can go a long way. It's an ESG plus. I mean, it's an ESG plus people and community um, benefit. And this must be embedded into the design. Right. So right now, this structure do not exist. I'm just really would like to you know, promote this, as, you know, as, that especially to the governments for, for their social and their community programs. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Helen, Alan, and thank you, everyone, for sharing. And I, th I believe that it's time to conclude this today's panel. And it's the beginning of the crisis. I believe we could not have anticipated uh, what's going on and because we were in an uncharted territory and there's no roadmap for social entrepreneurship community on how to respond but fortunately i think there it is not a path that we have to walk alone as we have uh, as we can see we have different social entrepreneurs sitting on today's table and i think to look ahead it, the vital work for social enterprises in building a more inclusive and resilient world is to put vulnerable community first and as what we said, we have to build a very sustainable community and to make things carry on. So it will depend on our ability to learn and grow together. And I hope that we can amplify the impact that we have been doing. And by working together, we can make uh, the future get better. Thank you very much, everyone, for sharing. And I hope you all have enjoyed today's session with our five excellent social entrepreneurs from across the world. And see if any one of you have any more other questions if not we will end this session today okay so thank you very much everyone have a good day thank you yes, thank, thank you, you. bye, bye.